When we talk about the X Factor today, and I look at someone like you, there aren't many of you around, are there? I mean, I can think of Elton John. He can write, yes. play, and sing. There aren't many people who can do all three. Well, I can't do all three. I can write and I can play. I can't sing. <laughs> well, I can sing in two. I can do harmonies. I do on the records, but I, have a, I don't have a, a singer's voice, I'm sorry to say. I wish I had. No, but I mean, but you, you can still pull off a tune, can't you? I can sing a song, but uh, nobody would listen. <laughs> You're lucky. I mean, that's the reason. And Bjorn and I was, in the beginning, we knew we could write some good stuff. So we recorded an album, him and me, singing. And, um, well, he can sing a little better than I, but not much. And, um, and then we were, we were together with the girls, Frida and Agnetta. So and they came in to help us out to do some backing vocals on our first album. A Swedish thing and uh, and then we said well, we, we crazy we should write the songs they should sing it you know and we should write pop music in English so we did we we we, we wrote a song called people need love this is the first thing we did in 1972 girls are singing we're doing some backing vocals and all of a sudden it was all there you know so very natural and uh, I mean I think it's quite clever of me and Bjorn not being the vocalists of this group. <laughs> <laughs> Bjorn is singing. Uh, every album, he's singing one song, just to sort of break break it up a bit on the albums. Uh, I think it uh, was good. What I did notice in the research was Eurovision played a part in two ways. One, of course, with ABBA. But prior to that, your writing brought ABBA together, didn't it? Absolutely, like we spoke about earlier. I mean, we were writing. We thought that we could write good songs. I mean, there were, there came a single with the Hollies, for example, and we said, well, we can do that, you know? But nobody cared and nobody thought we could, outside Sweden, that is. We sent out songs to um, publishers. Nothing was ever recorded. Yeah, Lonnie Donegan recorded one of the songs. Um, I don't remember the title of it, something about a train station. <laughs> But, uh, but that was it, and nobody wanted to listen. So we said, how on earth are we going to convince people outside Sweden that we, that we are a good bunch of people, we can do good things? And we said, well, we can enter the Eurovision because everybody is watching the Eurovision. And if we go there, even if we don't win it, we can still play a good song that we like, and people will recognize that there is a Swedish band called ABBA. You know? And that's why we entered, otherwise we would not have done that. And how did you choose the song that went on to create the beast that was Abbott? We had two songs to choose from. We had one more of sort of uh, more Eurovision type of thing called Hasta Mañana, which is on the same album, on the Waterloo album. Uh, and we had Waterloo and said, we want to do Waterloo because it's more like what we want to do, even if it doesn't fit into the Eurovision song contest. So we said, let's go with that because, you know, that's, that's more like what we want to be. And if, if we, we don't win, it doesn't matter. It's still the song we want to do. How do you feel when you go out on a stage and you know that it's make or break? Because Eurovision either creates something wonderful or, in many cases, ruins people's careers. Were you nervous? Were you excited? Or did you think this could be it? This is our moment? Well, we, obviously, if you're in the competition, you want to win it. That's how it works. Even if you can't compete in music, it's, it's sort of a silly thing. Nowadays, it's, it's crazy. It's, too, it's just too much, you know? Uh, and nothing ever... But I don't know. Did anything good came out of Eurovision since since uh, 1974? I'm not sure. Before that, good songs came up. You know, Volare was in there. Merci Cherie was in there. Uh, I don't know. Puppet on the String is a good song. This Spanish song, Eres Tu, was a lot of good stuff coming out. Now, I don't know. Do you think it's just there for parody and ridicule to bring us Europeans together against the rest of the world and for no other reason at all? I don't know, I think, I mean, it's just, it's good entertainment, isn't it? I mean, you sit there and watch it and you see those different acts <laughs> from different countries doing uh, sort of 100% everything in every number. And all the lights and all the lasers and all the cameras and everything. It's, it's, it's a really well-produced thing, but it's not for me, I must tell you, it's not. Having said that, the outrageous costumes that they wear today, back in the 70s, what you were wearing was, well, revealing at the very least. When they said to you, this is what you're going to wear, what was your reaction? 
No, we said what we wanted to wear. We wanted those clothes. Those clothes that we used for the Eurovision, they're really nice stuff. Take a look at them. They're good stuff. They're just in, in, in it rhymes, rhymes with the time and, and uh, they're, they're kind of neat. Then we put some other stuff on occasionally that wasn't <laughs> that nice. But those clothes uh, I really like. How did you feel when you looked in the mirror? Good. I felt good. With the high-heeled boots, with those, you know, the plateau shoes, yeah. But everybody was wearing them. You, want them, you, you walk the streets in Stockholm or London for that matter. You were all on, on plateau boots. Why shouldn't we? Do you still have those costumes? Oh, yes. They're now with this above uh, world thing. Are you ever tempted to try them on again and see if they still fit? I don't think I would. Well, maybe. I don't. I'm not too far away from it. I don't know, maybe 10 pounds? Yeah, no, no, I think you're doing fine. All right, we're going to come back next and talk about the musical years. We've already talked a little bit about Mamma Mia, but Christina's the new show. Uh, we'll talk about that next. We're back on your favourite local radio station talking to a legend. There's no other way of saying it. A question I want to ask you before I forget it. How does it feel to know that your music is going to be played 100 years after you're gone? Oh, we don't know that, do we? We know it's played now. And, uh, well, that's good enough for me, you know? We never thought. When we, when, I mean, when we, when ABBA closed down in 1982, we said, well, we might have a year, maybe two, little money coming in from old records all over the world, and that'll be it, guys, you know? And uh, that was not the case. Uh, and that's good enough for me. I don't know. If they're gonna play these songs in another 10 years time, great. I can't imagine why they won't, because a bit like the Beatles still being played today, it's of its time, they're well-written songs, they're songs everybody know and love. Why would they stop playing them? I don't know. Time changes, you know. Were you ever influenced by the Beatles? Oh, immensely. I mean, they were the reason I started to try to write songs. That's because before the Beatles, it wasn't that obvious that there were songwriters in the world, you know? It's like the singer is the song, the Elvis record is Elvis Presley, and nobody asked about uh, Jerry Lieber, Mike Stoller. They might be there on the record, but nobody cared. And all of a sudden, these guys came along and they, write, they wrote their own stuff. So one day I said, well, maybe one should try, you know? I can play the piano, uh, maybe I can write a song. And uh, I did, and it worked. <laughs> the hedonism of being in a band like ABBA, the same as the Beatles, how does that feel when you're it for that moment and there are literally tens of thousands of people waiting to see you get off a plane? Is there any way of describing that emotion? I don't think so. It comes with the territory, as they say. I mean, it's a, you know what's happening. You know that you, you sell these many records in Australia or in England or in Germany or wherever. And you know if you go there, there's going to be a little splash and there will be people around wanting to see you. You know that. And so, it, I don't know. It doesn't feel strange. It just feels normal. I've been a pop star since I was 18 years old. I was in a Swedish rock band called the Hep Stars when the audience were really, they were really screaming at that in, in those days. So I'm kind of used to it, you know? I don't know what it would be like not having had that. It's, it's very rewarding to, to realize that when you try to do something good, you write the song, you write Knowing Me, Knowing You, we record it, it comes out, and people like it. That's the thing. That's what it's all about. Uh, to have a communication with someone else. Now, if it's 10 guys or 10,000, it doesn't really matter, I would say. Uh, but again, I mean, it's, I'm living in a normal situation here and have been for like, I don't know, 45 years. So I can't tell you the difference. I don't know how it is to be you or someone else. I, know, I only know how it is to be me. <laughs> And the hedonism of it, were you ever tempted by the drugs and the way that so many went from your generation? No, no drugs. A little booze, but uh, no drugs. I don't know. It never, it never entered us, you know. 
we, and we were sort of solid. We had families, kids, and uh, we tried to behave like grown-ups. Can you understand, though, being at the level of fame you were, that it is hard coming off stage from 30,000 people to nothing? How do you make that adjustment? Well, you take a deep breath and you, you sort of, your, your head is sort of spinning. You've been for two hours on stage and you come off and you just try to sit back and have a drink and uh, doing nothing. It depends on how you, how you look upon yourself, right? If you, it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a thing that's really dangerous, I think, and that's the, to distinguish the difference between your talent and your, the image of yourself and your own self, you know? If you believe that these 30,000 watching you is actually watching you instead of listening to the music you created because of the talent you had, then I think you could be in deep trouble. And then I think it's very, very difficult to fill uh, the hole that probably is within you, you know? Having said that, the relationships you had in ABBA didn't last. Do you think that was possibly down to the pressure and the stress and the level of show business that you reached internationally? Not at all. Absolutely not. I'd say the opposite. I'd say that if, we, if it hadn't been for ABBA, we wouldn't have been together that long, you know? That held us together. We had this thing going. We all enjoyed it. It was really important for all of us, the careers within ABBA, and uh, that kept us going longer. I believe so. Would you like to go back to 1975, let's say, just for a week to experience that again, or are you happy leaving that in the past? No, I'm fine now. This is good, you know. Uh, I, I enjoy life as it is, and uh, I enjoy what I'm doing. I have my orchestra, 16-piece band, and um, yeah, I want to do that. And we do that. In, we did this record in English because it was lying around. I've been working with them now for, well, with the Fiddlers for, I don't know, 20 years, and with my band since, I don't know, what is it, seven, eight years? And as we had those songs lying around, most of them are instrumental, so they don't need a translation. Some are in Swedish, and Bjorn translated them. So we, just for, for the heck of it, you know, we released it. And uh, Universal said, yeah, fine, let's do that, you know. Seems interesting that fundamentally you're a folk artist and a folk lover, because that really is the essence of your music, yet what you're known for is pop. Does that bother you? Do you wish you'd have been a jazz artist or a folk artist or a classical artist? Because, I mean, you're all of these things if you listen to it within your music, yet you're a pop artist. Well, I'm, to start with, I'm not an artist. I just happen to be one of the four members of ABBA and I could play the piano. I'm not an artist. I can run my band and I can be on stage and I can talk to the audience just to feel them, make them feel comfortable and all that, but I'm not an artist. I might be almost a musician. I'm just a so songwriter and a piano player on stage with, I mean, the girls are artists, but I'm not a stage, a, uh, I'm not a stage artist, you know? I'm not a singer, I'm not a performer. So that leads me to my next question then. Would you have been happy just writing these songs and being the man behind it? Is it almost irrelevant, the fact that you were on stage with ABBA for all those years? In a way, yes. The thing is, though, you write a song, you don't give it away to someone. Say, here is a song, you can do whatever you like. You have to follow it through. You have to be on top of the whole, the whole process till the end of it, you know, to make sure that it is as good as it can be according to, well, to my preferences. Could be as good with someone else doing it, but you never know. So uh, that means that everything that I've been involved in, I've been staying sort of really close to until it's done. Even if it was Christina the musical, which is like a three and a half hour thing, or um, the music for chess, or anything. You have to be in there and you have to have your the last word, so the final cut of things because otherwise you never know what's going to happen. So I don't write songs for other people, just give them away. I write songs, maybe for other artists, but I want to be involved in the process. 